I mean, give me a sense of how you think this became so prominent. I mean, is it, you use this example of it being like a, a, a religion, and on some level there is, there's always this quality to having uh, a, um, a, a field of study that is, um, that is so, um, I guess, uh, uh, difficult to permeate in some ways that it it becomes rarefied. But how was it in the context of our um, educational system? Uh, a did this become so much of a religion? And B is there is this an is there an analog in in uh, in in other I guess Western countries in terms of of math being this prominent or uh, is it? Are there examples of, of what you are advocating? Okay, good enough. Uh, first of all, part of it is, is obviously intellectual inertia. It's always been there. We have over 200,000 people who teach math in high school and colleges who kind of have, I must say, an intellectual vested interest in what they know and they want to keep teaching it. But something else has happened, and there is the subtitle of my book, what I call STEM STEM delusions. STEM, as we all know, is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And now we're suddenly being told that the United States is falling behind other countries in STEM skills. They're moving ahead of us. We're going to lose the global competition. This, is, Sam, is a total myth. We do not need more people with STEM degrees. In fact, most of the people who majored in STEM subjects at college are not working in the STEM fields. We don't create that many jobs in STEM. And what we do need is really creativity. Uh, take something like Google or Apple's products or uh, Twitter. That's not just technology. There's a, an imagination, a playfulness about how we'll use our minds and going across. So. I think we need just as many design, artistic, liberal arts graduates as we do STEM graduates. What do you think it's I mean, contributing to this? I mean, my sense is on some level, you know, we, 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 we have the ascendance of the engineer in some respect. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know if it's because of like, I don't know, Bill Gates is just funding everybody. <laughs> and uh, so we all sort of uh, agree with that. I mean, uh, what, is, is that... Uh, I mean, is that a part of that? I mean, because to a certain extent, we've seen um, that um, uh, uh, liberal arts degrees have become, you know, almost ascendant now in that tech world. But at the same time, I, I don't know. I mean, give me uh, elaborate on that idea that uh, where does this STEM delusion come from? OK, the STEM delusion comes from that out there are super smart Koreans and Chinese who are mastering mathematics and they're going to rule the world. Now, uh, in fact, by the way, the reason why uh, the Chinese and the Koreans uh, do as well as they do in various, say, international math competitions is they study 23 hours a day. And if the competitions were in, let's say, chess or crossword puzzles, they'd study 23 hours a day and master them as well. Now, uh, what we'd simply say is that in the United States, uh, we don't have as many people willing to work 23 hours a day, at least not at the technical subjects. But they are very good. Take, for example, video games. Video games are not just high tech. They're, you have to do the plot. You have to do the uh, costumes, the music, the artwork, the acting. Uh, all of that's what makes for a good video game. Uh, I've learned that in the video industry, three quarters of the people are not tech people. Right. And and so, um, what happens next? Well, well, I mean, how does something a reform like this gain any uh, steam? Well, it, part of it comes down to a word you used earlier: rigor. Uh, there's the notion that Americans are growing soft and flabby. Uh, you know, and we have to have more rigor. Uh, this is kind of the old Puritan idea, and in many ways I'm a teacher. I agree in, you know, the rigorous use of the mind. But And then somehow we get the notion that it's only math and science that's true rigor, and that is really shooting ourselves in the foot. Because what is, you know, the interesting kind of rigor is inventing something like McDonald's or Starbucks, 
you know, uh, I know there's a bit of uh, high tech in Starbucks coffee, but the whole idea of Starbucks, which is, and McDonald's sweeping the world, is, you know, unfettered imagination, a playfulness about what to do. And I find this whole STEM thing with its rigor, you can't be playful anymore. Hey, there, there's also, it seems to me, to be some type of paradox, and maybe it's just, a, again, a misunderstanding uh, on my part of, of what constitutes sort of math and where, where uh, something like this, but we're living in an age which seems to me to be as data-oriented as any that we've had ever. Um, and, and, and I don't think that's just a function of, of having computers. I mean, I think there's a disposition towards, towards data and, and, and maximization of, uh, optimization of, of everything in some respects. Uh, well, let me uh, go, go on. Go no, on no, you, please. Uh, let me go on with data here. Uh, I'm all in favor of data, uh, and a sensible adult way of looking at it. For example, one of the uh, assignments I gave to students in my numeracy class was to give them a uh, government document called DEATHS, D-E-I-T-H-S, rather somber. All the causes why people died in the last year. And it's a big book, almost 100 pages, filled with hundreds, thousands of numbers. And I said, let's see what we can find out. Well, one of the things we looked at is causes of death for young people, age 15 to 25. Young men, 15 to 25 causes of death. Then we broke it down by race. And guess what we discovered? You had to look at the numbers. It's data very carefully. Among young white men, the chief cause of death was automobile accidents. Among the black men, the chief cause of death was being shot by a gun. Mm. Now, that tells us about two Americas, two ways of death. And you're dead at the end of both, but look what happens. And imagine the discussion you can get started once you get those numbers in front of you. So numbers tell a story. I'm in favor of numbers. And, and so where, where does, I mean, where, how, how does this break through? I mean, where, where are the, um, uh, you know, the... Uh, where are the, in terms of reform, and maybe this is sort of outside of, of your portfolio, but, uh, but you know, uh, putting your, your policy uh, hat back on, where or uh, where would you start? I mean, where, I mean, is this something where it has to be accepted by, um, you know, the, I guess the Department of Education needs to come to this realization first? Is this something that you perceive could come out of the states? I mean, where is the... Uh, entree um, in the in our educational system to sort of introduce this idea okay uh, good enough uh, I just say that when I propose to my math mathematician friends that they do something like my studying of death certificates they say oh yes we'll do statistics but you need to study algebra first and I say, no, 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 a simple abacus will do. But let's go back to your question of where you start. Here's, I have in front of me a list of over 100 really good colleges that do not require the SAT. They're colleges like Pfizer out in the West Coast, uh, uh, Colorado College in, I guess where, Colorado, mm -hmm. Bates. Bowden and so on. They don't require the SAT. In particular, they don't require the math section in it. They're willing to admit the students without those, you know, terrifying math scores. And they discovered that students without the SAT do just as well as the other students. So what I want to do is to persuade more and more colleges, and through them the high schools, that you don't have to have a full four-year mathematical sequence for everybody. After the first or second year, introduce options, like, as I said, my numeracy 101. And I've discovered that liberal arts colleges, which are pulling away from the SAT, are willing to talk about that. Yes, and I like that idea. Yeah, I mean, don't you have a, a, a concern that potentially, you know, when you start with um, uh, things, uh, institutions like, uh, like higher education or in particularly sort of private uh, colleges, that um, 
you um, you may be leaving behind a lot of people. I mean, isn't that one of the uh, the 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 criticisms? Is that this, in some ways, um, to uh, to diminish the role of math in some ways is um, uh, creates a sort of uh, class uh, puts people uh, of of lower income at a disadvantage because they won't be able to to access this stuff, or it it, it sends it. it I mean, I guess it gets back to the rigor question, but uh, I know that there's been some criticism of this idea that it, in some ways it, um, it will shut the door to, uh, to women in these fields and to people coming from uh, lower income. Uh, I think it's just the opposite. Uh, what's happened is because we have one size fits all with mathematics, for example, that is the case in the Common Core. The Common Core, which, as you, we all know, is going to be introduced really full steam next year in over 40 states. The Common Core is a single test for everyone, male, female, rich, poor, math-oriented, math-suicidal. And they call it college or career ready, but it really means college ready. In other words, the math people are imposing a college-type curriculum on everybody. Now, should everybody go to college? In fact, as a college teacher, I think so. But for all sorts of things, you can study modern dance, you can study poetry, you can study design. Uh, you don't have to do, everybody doesn't have to be expert in STEM subjects. And I would say on the class question that just as many people from the suburbs, you know, uh, turn, to use my phrase, suicidal over geometry, as do from other social classes. It's not a class thing at all. Andrew Hacker, uh, author of The Math Myth and Other STEM Delusions. I, I wish I could take your class in numeracy. I feel like I desperately need it. And uh, uh, but So if that ever goes online, uh, please let us know. Thanks so much for your time today. Well, it's been a lot of fun talking with you, Sam.